Yes, yes. we can do that next day. <laughs> okay, well, welcome everyone. It's my great pleasure uh, to have here today to uh, give our first talk of the MVP seminar of this uh, spring semester, Professor Daniel Pei. Uh, he is going to uh, talk about uh, neurons and uh, uh, how to model. I believe so. Yes. <laughs> uh, so you can read the title of the talk. It's from the structure of the neuron to artificial neuro neural networks. The perceptron as a roadmap. That's my the first time that I encountered this concept, perceptron. So I'm looking forward to learn about that. Uh, um, uh, you can interrupt him if you need to, if you want to ask questions at any at, at any point. He uh, will be happy to uh, answer your questions. Yeah. And uh, yeah, please. Okay, thank okay. you. So I wish first to thank uh, Marco and Jose for this uh, invitation. So the title uh, you 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 can see it from the structure of the neuron to artificial neural networks, the perceptron as a roadmap. Uh, so this. Okay. So yes. That's a technical problem. Ah, that's the problem yeah. of the yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, it will... yeah. So this is really a talk which is based on the course I'm, I'm giving at CAPS so on machine learning. So I wish to thank uh, our directors and in particular Adrian for allowing me to give this course on, on machine learning at CATS. So it's based on this. And so uh, I would like to mention some collaborations and papers. I have two undergraduate students, uh, Erin Babit and Shelby Grossman, who are finishing a paper on uh, you know, the new history of a neuron and all these kind of things. And I would like to mention the following uh, research papers with Kamal and Michaela, and also with a group in, in uh, Italy and Kamal on, the first one is really uh, neural networks in the bicomplex case, and the other one, are, our papers are kind of related to uh, machine learning and mathematics, but it is really to hint that uh, when you do machine learning, there are a lot of uh, mathematics which intervene. And finally, I would like, I don't know if he's online, but I'd like to thank also uh, Pale Jorgensen, who uh, we discussed a lot on robots in curl spaces and machine learning. So in any event, the, the main point of the lecture would be uh, so I would like to discuss the history of the structure of a neuron, the so-called neuron doctrine. And then I would like to discuss the history of origin of a perceptron and artificial neural networks, the perceptron controversy, and more generally uh, neuron, uh, machine learning. I would like to study the connections between them and also the mathematical tools which are used for the perceptron. And I'll discuss also other mathematica mathematical tools which are used in machine learning and or in artificial neural networks. I mean, artificial neural networks is only part of machine learning, of course, and we'll see a lot of uh, other tools like positive definite kernels, like dynamical systems and hypercomplex analysis. And the uh, not so hidden agenda in this uh, last point is to show that I think uh, this kind of course would be of interest for people, students at the MPP program. So, um, what is the talk about? So I would like to describe a path really from the discovery of a neuron, the fact that the neuron was an independent unit, I mean, it took some time to discover, as I saw the neuron doctrine, to a theory of artificial neural networks. And around the 60s of the century, there was a perceptron which was discovered, which is really the building unit of, of artificial neural networks, if you want. And in, in some sense, uh, a certain neuron model inspired the perceptron and the latter is a building block of artificial neural networks. If you allow me to backtrack, you see that here it's in red, the neuron doctrine and perceptron controversy. It is in red because the path was far from being smooth. There were a lot of uh, opposition and a lot of problems in, in this. So it was far from a smooth path in, in both cases. Uh, so we talk a lot about the brain, that would be neuroscience, but about the field of neural computation in some sense. That's more about this. Um, so, uh, I would like just to define what is, uh, to the beginning, what, was, what is your computing. I'll, I'll just take a definition from this uh, book. Uh, technological discipline concerned with information processing system that autonomously develop operational capabilities. This is important, autonomously develop operational, cap operational capabilities in that that is a response to an information environment. 
uh, in, this is a fancy definition. I mean, in uh, plain words, it's been just uh, to mimic the brain, if you want. But this is a more fancy, fancy word to say it. And some in preferences, <laughs> not really, not really, not really related to the talk, but to the neural computing in general. So very interesting references. Uh, so the last one is uh, on model brain function and the world of attractor neural networks. We, of Daniel Amit is of special interest because it, it really uh, shows how dynamical system appear here. The second, the last two, the last one um, has a strange, a strange title in some sense: simulated annealing and Boltzmann machines. And I will discuss what it is in the next slide, um, and then we'll go to the topic more on the topic of the lecture. So, uh, what is uh, annealing? Uh, so in uh, uh, material science, I mean, when you have a material, uh, quenching is to make the uh, material very hard. And annealing is a procedure to have it more smooth and uh, to lower the energy. And um, what is the relation with uh, what we are doing here with the models? Well, there is uh, this, model, this paper, a very old paper of uh, Metropolis, Rosenblut, and Teller. Teller here is a Teller of the hydrogen bomb. Uh, and they, they made... Uh, they, they introduced some random, uh, random, uh, uh, random method just to to get a lower energy, to get the lower energy. And um, the idea is that memory. This is toward the end of the lecture. I would like to say, at least in the artificial neural network, memory is can be seen as a energy minimal states in dynamical systems. So this is if you want to have a connection with uh, Metropolis and Teller. <laughs> Uh, what was before, so let me a little bit backtrack once more, what was recent really references on neurocomputing, I would like to, to, to proceed. And uh, so I mentioned uh, the perceptron. So the perceptron will play an important role in, um, in this lecture. So what is a perceptron? Uh, what is interesting that those of the people in this field, they are not mathematicians. I mean, Rosenblatt, as you see, died very young, but he was a psychologist. And he defined a perceptron, uh, any theoretical system which attempts to explain the psych psychological function of a brain, uh, once more, a brain model, if you want to write this in a more fancy way. And we'll see precisely what it means. And as I, uh, as I already said, it is really the, the unit of, uh, the, I mean, the, the, the building block of artificial neural networks. Uh, but that was before that, of course, that in, it, it was around 62. This is the, his book. As you can see, the, the title is uh, Principle of Neurodynamics. Uh, it's from six, so it's very far really from machine learning, one would think. So, uh, what is a perceptron? So, as we will see in the sequel, it is really an algorithm. So, let's say you have two classes of uh, elements, and you know you can separate them by a hyperplane. So there are two pictures, and you know, it is given ahead of time, but you know that you can, the hyperplane will not be unique. Uh, in the second picture, you forget about the, the fat uh, strip. I mean, the fat strip would be, would be connected to support vector machines. This is not the topic. Just look at the two lines. So you see that the, the hyperplane will not be unique in general. I mean, of course, you can, see, you can look at cases where it will be unique, but in general, it will not be unique. And... The perceptron algorithm, which you would see in the, in the, in the sequel, allows to, to find a, a, an hyperplane in a bounded number of times, iteration. The, the, the point is bounded. It will be always finite. I mean, if you start with finite uh, uh, classes, whatever you do, it will always be finite. Take one, one, I mean, it will be always finite. But here, with some hypothesis, you can get an upper bound on the number of iterations you will need. So this is very important. Of course, it will depend. It will depend on the on the, your original hypothesis, but when I say bounded, uh, I want to distinguish it with finite. With, with some hypothesis, we know that it will be less than a certain number. It will be clearer when I give a... Uh, sorry, the yeah. object in question uh, yeah. as a numerable, or it can be of any cardinality? Uh, the class is, in fact, uh, I don't... Uh, when I wrote... Uh, let me say, no, I think it can be any cardinality. I would have to double check. Okay, you. so it's not, uh, uh, it can be a situation in which there is only one plane at the top. Oh, no, because you have an hypothesis that they, 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 they need more than one plane. And we need more. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I mean, it, it's not a unique situation. You, you will see. Because okay. if it's a unique, it will not work. 
Okay. But there is, a, there is a condition, something like that. You suppose that there exists a vector A. You don't know what is this vector. Uh -huh. But you suppose it exists. So you have the supremum, or I think the, inf sorry, the infimum of the inner product of A with all elements in your classes is strictly positive. And here is this delta. The bounding will be in terms of this delta. Basically, it will be one over delta squared. So even if here there is an infinite number, it will be bounded by, I think, one over delta square or something like this. So which is very powerful. And, and you know that it will stop. Of course, in principle, you don't know because you don't know delta. But even if you run it, you know that it will stop uh, in principle. So you can hope that in practice, it will also stop. And the second picture, just want to show that you, you don't have uniqueness. Now, um, if, uh, in the picture, I don't see it yet. You see a, a large screen. This is when you want to have support vector machines and have uh, to, to, to separate them as, as, uh, in a, as wide as possible. But this is not the topic. Simply, I just pick up this picture and there was a two, two together. OK? Tanya, so, yeah. sorry. Existence is not guaranteed either. Uh, no, it, it is. Once you suppose that there is this A, there is an algorithm which will compute one. So there is independent of what you, class you, A class Your starting point is the following. You have two classes. Right. You know that you can separate them. Mm -hmm. Oh, OK. I, I got it. Okay. You, you know, because of no, no, okay. 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 Yeah. So it's a lot of hypotheses. Yeah. Okay. But the, the fascinating thing is that then with hypothesis on your data, you can get an upper bound of the number of iterations. And you always can get a hyperplane, not the... No, no, an upper plane. A hyperplane. Yes. Then when we can, when this cannot we we'll see how to go to higher dimension, but this is towards the end of the lecture. Okay. So, um, as I said, it's always finite if the classes are finite, but we get an, a, an upper bound. This is important. Okay. So, um, I mentioned the neuron. So, um, what is the neuron? I will mention. So, um, so here we have a, a scheme of a neuron. Uh, so you see there is the cell body, and when you see a very large appendix, which is called the axon, and a smaller one, which are called the dendrites. And what happens in the brain is that, okay, they're, conne they're not connected. This is the whole point. But let's say that in an approximation, they're kind of connected. The information goes in one direction, and one axon is kind of, is not connected, but close to the dendrite of another one. And when the information is processed, when there is an action potential, they, they connect together, and otherwise they, they separate. And it goes only in one way. So this is, for the sequel, I mean, for, uh, it's very important, this uh, picture. You have a long, a long uh, appendix, which is called the axon, and it's a one-way direction. So the information, uh, which is in terms of, uh, of uh, electrical, electrical or chemical uh, um, uh, signal uh, will go from along the axon, from one axon to the don't right and so on. It's, it doesn't go back, there is no feedback. And uh, once more, uh, they're not connected together, but almost connected. And when information passes, they, mm -hmm. they just uh, uh, stick together. So this is, uh, there is much, much more, of course, there is much more in the, in the neuron, but this is the, we'll see back this picture in the sequel, but and, and the connection, so they, it's called the synaptic, it's called the synapses and the synaptic gap and the synaptic connection. So what can I tell you? There is much more to say, but here this is what I want to say. And of course, what I said is wrong. Uh, for us, what, what we need is correct. I mean, this is correct. But there are different, a lot of kinds of neurons, not only these ones, I want to say. And this is an oversimplified figure. But for the purpose of this lecture, this is what we need. And uh, in new aspects of neuron doctrine, sometimes you have counterexamples, like in mathematics. Yes, you have sometimes uh, uh, don't try scale of synaptic outputs, and axon can have inputs from other axons. So uh, they can be counterexamples. And, but the picture I wrote before, I, I showed before, is very important and is, is relevant. It's not uh, that suddenly it doesn't exist. And of course, uh, gray matter, what matter? The gray matter is really the neuron cell bodies, the axon terminals. And the axons are coated with myelin to protect them. This is really the white matter. Yes, so this is um, so this picture will be very important. The, uh, one one long um, uh, one long um, uh, uh, appendix, if you want, and a lot of little ones. And there is in the middle of the nucleus to process information. And when it goes from one neuron to the other, it's called an action potential. Mm -hmm. Yes, so this is uh, um, this is what I could gather. 
Okay, so uh, this uh, so this survey for the part of this talk. So this theory of the discovery of a neuron, I think, is very important in the neuron, doc, doc, neuron doctrine to understand how the artificial neural networks really uh, evolved. So I would like to say some steps. It's not an well, it's kind of an history, but there are only the main steps. It's sort of history of a neuron from from A to Z. I mean, just uh, some main steps. Uh, first of all, at the beginning of the 19th century, microscopes got better. Before that, there was no 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 way to see what is inside the brain. When microscopes, and Michaela pointed me that there is a misprint that microscopes, so I, I saw it. <laughs> but um, when, uh, the, when the neurons got, uh, when the microscopes got better, then you needed new histological methods. And then come into place a very interesting character, Camille Golgi, who developed histological methods, new histological methods to, to be able to see better uh, what would be with uh, a new microscopes, even the more, more powerful microscopes. Sorry, can I make a Italian uh, it... Camillo Gorgi? Okay. <laughs> Camillo Gorgi. 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 <laughs> Gorgi. So. With the handles. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Otherwise, it's not Italian. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, but that can be worse because. <laughs> it, it, I think it's it, a it first of the Italian Nobel Prize. Oh. <laughs> Uh, so um, he, he found he, he developed new methods based on the, uh, uh, silver staining. But I think silver staining. I mean, when there, before the computers and the, you know the, the cameras we have, and when you go when we have usual uh, uh, cameras, I think it was one of the way to develop uh, pictures. Uh, anyway, the silver silver staining allows to to see to visualize uh, elements, and uh, he got a Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine with Santiago Ramon de Cajal in 06, 1906. What is interesting is that he developed the methods which allowed to see that the axon and the dendrites are not connected together, but he refused to the very end to accept this, this uh, theory. And even in his speech, in his Nobel Prize speech, he mentioned the, the following. Uh, this is from his speech. However, opposed it may seem to the popular tendency to individualize, to individualize the elements, I cannot abandon the, 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 the idea of a unit reaction of a nervous system. But they are not connected, it's an individual unit. But it has been found thanks to it, uh, to, it to the methods it developed. Now in life, one has to be patient because he developed this when he was 28, but he got the Nobel Prize 35 years later. So that's also interesting. Um, so there are two questions I mentioned related to do the novel fibers uh, for continu continuous network and so on, but this is not, uh, I want to let me proceed. So this is a, Gol a, Golgi, a Golgi plate. Okay, so of course from here, you cannot see that the neurons are separated, but I, I assume when you look at the microscope with this, then you, you can kind of see that they are separated, the neurons. Uh, okay, so uh, some more steps. So, uh, uh, still, your microscope doesn't have a misprint. So, Theodor Schwann uh, was one of the first to su suggest that the brain was made of individual cells. Uh, he's a proponent of cell theory. Both plants and animals are composed of cells, but this was not accepted for the brain because you cannot really see in the brain. I mean, you needed the methods of Golgi, and maybe, but even then, you cannot really see, so it was not, uh, it was not really accepted. I mentioned, and this is not a list of all the persons, it should be clear. I mean, I just mentioned uh, some high points. Uh, William Hills, transmission without continuity is possible. And then a very interesting character. In this talk, I mentioned a lot of Nobel Prizes in uh, physiology or medicine, but Friedhoff, he got the Nobel Prize, the Peace Nobel Prize. He was kind of a polymath. So um, in, his thesis was also on the fact that uh, uh, the, uh, there, there is no connection between the axon and the and the dendrites, but uh, then he left, uh, I guess, biology, and uh, he he was in politics, and uh, he, uh, he also he got the Nobel Prize in uh, twenty two, the Peace Nobel Prize, because uh, for that, for his action for the refugees, and in particular the Nansen passports, which were uh, documents given to the refugees in thirty eight. And he was also an Arctic explorer. 
And you see here the price motivation was for his leading role in the repatriation of prisoners of war in international relief work at the League of Nations High Commission, Commissioner of Refugees. So I assume it would have given, gotten also the Nobel Prize in uh, Medicine, but he got a prize. Of... So uh, this is a Groenland, which he crossed. I think he was the first three to cross it. So you see on the right, this is Europe, and on the left, you can see Canada. So it, it's a, it's an island. I mean, it's not only ice. I mean, uh, there is, uh, it's really an island. And, um, and here you can see an Onsen passport in French, because uh, then I think your French was the uh, uh, language of diplomacy. So Did they still exist? No, no, in 38, they stopped. As, uh, uh, this is what I, I, I write. Uh, okay, so um, one more, sorry, one more, uh, uh, one more uh, remark that the neuron was, the term neuron was coined by Val in 91, and there are really three, there are a lot of names. But here I mentioned Val Mayer, uh, Ronnie Cajal, and Sherrington about uh, understanding that these are not connected together. And uh, here I mentioned once more uh, Santiago Ramon de Cajal, who this. He got a Nobel Prize for this, really. So uh, he, 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 it's built on all the, all, the, all, the, all the other people, of course, but he, he was, I guess, the main uh, proponent. And also uh, Sherrington. And as I said, it's called the synapse, the connection between the, the axon and the dendrite. Okay, so, um, so this is uh, Santiago Ramon y Cajal. And this is a great book. I mean, um, uh, there was a book 25 years before, but this is a re-edition, Foundations of a Neuron Doctrine, where there is a whole history and a real great book. Okay, so, um, apart from, so what is a neuron specificity? Of course, it's a, it's a cell, but uh, it does something more than other cells. I mean, it processes information. So, so a neuron processes information. How is information processed? So you will need mathematical models for a neuron to see how the information is processed. And um, I would like to mention um, the, what's called the Ebian rule, which uh, basically says uh, uh, acts, uh, neurons fire together, grow together, basically. This is what it says in, in other words here. I mean, I will, I will not read the, the, the sentence, but basically it says, if two neurons are together, are close together and one grows, I mean, they, they will, that they would grow together. So that's basically the idea. And uh, if you wanted more other words, learning is doing adjustment. Now, um, so but there are really two parallel questions, if you want, a mapping of a brain and models for neurons. So um, for the mapping of a brain, there, there is a, a, an interesting uh, uh, character, which is the aplegia we mentioned. So uh, Eric Kendall, who also got this Nobel Prize, thought that, well, our brain has so many neurons to make a model, but you can take a simpler, um, simpler element, simpler uh, animal. And uh, the Aplicia has 20, he's not the only one who did such things, but uh, 20,000 neurons. And then you can map, basically, when the neurons are big, this is, the, uh, this is Kendall, but this is the Aplicia, the neurons are, are big. And so you can, you can um, map which, which, which every neuron is doing, basically, or at least you can try to map. So this is about the so mapping of it, a brain. It has a few number of neurons, but bigger. And bigger, yes. Yes. And uh, he's intelligent? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, on, on YouTube, you can see uh, Eric Kendall. He's a very, very nice character. And he's giving a lecture, I think, at MIT or Stanford. He has his application here uh, in a, you know, a bunker, and he has the students to touch. He shows them to students. <laughs> very, very, uh, um, very nice person. Okay, in any event, uh, that was also mapping of a brain. But let's say about the models. So uh, in the mathematical models, you can think of two kinds of models, at least. I mean, one would be based on the physiology. So really, uh, this is not the models which, mention, which are interest for us, but I, I will mention them. And then models maybe on a higher level, like more uh, mechanical. So um, for the biological models, there is, of course, a huge structure. <laughs> I would like to mention a, um, a paper from 07, uh, Louis Lapic, Recherche Quantitative sur l'excitation électrique des nerfs traités comme une polarisation. And this model is still uh, valid. What is interesting that he wrote um, papers with his wife, and in the, uh, and in the paper, it was explicitly written that it was joint work with 
with equal um, equal um, collaborations. Uh, so uh, Nikola Rashevsky, which was a mathematical biologist in Chicago, and I mentioned him because Pete, who is an important character in the talk, uh, will be mentioned in the sequel, and Ogin Oxley, who um, uh, Nobel Prize uh, for her model in terms of ordinary differential equations. When I teach ODEs, I tell my students, you can say it's an, you can get a Nobel Prize if you get the correct uh, ODE, <laughs> but <laughs> it's a bit, uh, it doesn't give them motivation, unfortunately. <laughs> but they, they are it's also easy, they are the bifurcation, catastrophic, I mean, it's a bit difficult. And another uh, more recent uh, Nobel Prize in 14, I just mentioned this, just as, uh, there is a lot, a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, activity, research activity, and these are just uh, uh, four of them, but about to be uh, But then we get to the part which is more of interest in this lecture. So up to now, if you want to do some generalities, and I would like to get to the, we now are getting closer to the perceptron. So we want to model on a higher level, more, at, uh, more abstract oriented. And this is Maculopitz, Rosenblatt, and Orfield, basically. Now, if you think about it, as I said before, uh, an, uh, um, a neuron is a one-zero system. I mean, of course, in practice, maybe it is not, but this model we have, it's a one-zero system. Or, or, it, or it fires or it doesn't fire. So you can view it basically like uh, in one-to-one -one correspondence with logic, really, because uh, with a zero-one, with Boolean functions. So this is what uh, Maculo and Pitts, they, uh, they try to do. So let me mention the, uh, some words on Michael and Pete, are two different, completely different persons, and then the model they made. So uh, McCullough, uh, he, he had philosophy, psychiatry and neurophysiology, sorry, uh, and he was a neuropsychiatrist, and he was looking for what he called a psychon, like a, a elementary unit of a, of a thought, of a least psychic act. I mean, I don't think he did very much on it, but that was his dream. And uh, that would be the atom uh, to chemistry then. And Pitts was totally the opposite. He was a runaway uh, guy. He was a mathematician. The story says that he met by chance uh, Russell in a park, that he, he was in a library and read all the, uh, the book of Russell and Whitehead of, during three days. A lot of stories. Maybe they are true, maybe they are not true. The point is that he was interested in logic and, and, and that with the interest of, of Macaulay, it, it just uh, fit together. This is the importance which we can take from this. And uh, they began to work in 42 in Chicago when Macaulay was at the Illinois New York Psychiatric Institute and Pitts was in Rashevsky Group at University of Chicago, which I mentioned before. So um, they, uh, on, about this history of this collaboration, there are interesting paper from uh, Tara Abraham. I, I will not uh, re, uh, read them, but these are two, pa two papers, which uh, these papers, they do not mention, they are not related to the co collection of pits with Norbert Wiener. I mean, for the analyst in the group, our Wiener, yes. But toward the end of his life, Wiener uh, uh, was interested in such topics. He took pits with, uh, as a PhD student, and then from one day to the other, uh, was over, and then, uh, but uh, it, this is a winner, if you want. And um, so the main, the main idea in the model of uh, Pitts, uh, of Maculo and Pitts, and in two slides, that will be really the key of the lecture, you know, the main key of the lecture. The main, the main idea is that in, in the logic, in propositional logic, if you want, there is true and false, and then you run off and on. And so you can make a connection, and hopefully you can, you can uh, model everything. So uh, they made a number of assumptions in their paper to have a, to, to, to have a model, uh, which, which are based on the model for the uh, physio physiological model of, uh, of a neuron. Um, it's a all one process. You, uh, you need the number of a synapses, you need a certain number of input for an output to be given, to, to, to fire. Uh, so, and they have a, these are the first, the very important uh, 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 hypothesis, the other, the other three are also important, so I will not read them. The first one says that it's zero one, and the other one, if you want, you need enough input so for the for when you want to, to fire. And of course, these assumptions were in, uh, directly inspired by a neuron biological structure. 
So what does it mean? One is zero one, and the other you need enough impulse to five. It, it means that. Yeah, look back. Let me just let me. Oh, sorry. Where was it? Uh, yeah. You see, uh, here you have your your neuron. So you you need to have enough inputs to the dendrites so that it would be charged enough if you want so that it would fire. This is what is meant. Okay, but then the state is would be one. One or zero. Yes, yes. So there is no intermediate. No, no, there is no intermediate. In any case. No, no, in any case, it should not be intermediate. Yes, yes, this is very maybe it was not written linear, but it is all zero or one. Absolutely. And so here you see the maculum uh, model, and of course, from far away in the fog, if you want, it is the same. You have you have an you have uh, an, an out, you have input, uh, but here these inputs are zero one. Soon there will not be zero one anymore, and you have a function g. I have to write what it is. It is a nonlinearity. Without the nonlinearity, one cannot do anything, and then the output will be zero and one. But this is a model, and I will, and uh, it's that it, you can see better here. But before, allow me to backtrack once more. It's directly inspired. Uh, so that's why this model of a neuron was important. And you see you have inputs and you have weights. They are not written here. The weights do not appear on the on these little uh, 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 little intervals which uh, model the don't write, but each one has a weight. And so the input is the sum of a wj xj, let's say at time t. It's just a bias if we need a bias. If this is positive, it fires. F is a side function, otherwise it is zero. So this is a way to, to model the, this is a, this is a Maculopitz uh, model. Um, and so let me just repeat the, if we, the, the double J, the weights of the input are the counterparts of the don't rise in some sense. Uh, they are not, in the model of Rosenblatt, they will be updated here, they are not updated. Rosenblatt is basically the same thing, simply uh, the weight will be updated and the inputs will not be zero one, but the output will always be zero and one. And the, bio the biological action potential is modeled by the heavyside function. You could think of other functions. I mean, the heavyside function is this one. You could also think later, not for this example, but you could think of functions like, which would be, I mean, one can think, could think of other functions in practice, but for this model, you will need really zero one. So the beside function is the best. And the non-linearity is the key here. I mean, without the non-linearity, nothing would be possible. B, and, B is also, is, that, is determined by the neuron? Uh, it's a value that depends only on the neuron? I guess, yes, yes, yes. It, it is fixed. It's a B. bias. They call it a bias. Mm -hmm. uh, but usually, we, we, it, we, we put zero, in fact. Right. But so, if they're more than they are, like a minimum level. To minimum level yeah, for, yeah, right, to, yes. to work. Yes. Yeah. It some more freedom. And I guess different neurons are going to have different f. Yeah, yes, yes. No, no. The f is the same for everyone. It's the same for the, every neuron. The, the, the number of inputs uh -huh. and the, the weights will be different. I see. Okay. So, so the number of inputs is fixed. Fixed the number of inputs and we is the... the, the weight, yes. The yeah. Yeah. But let me backtrack here. The number of inputs will be different from the each one. The number of inputs, the weights of the inputs. Yes, but only one output. Only one and output. the one output is fixed by this high function. So it will be one or zero. Okay. 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 And so they... Uh, so this is a, from their, from their uh, paper. They have some, uh, some uh, logical pictures. I mean, uh, it's a bit, a bit difficult to read. And... Um, so, so that's their model. Before I go to Mac, to uh, to Rosenblatt and um, and the perceptron, uh, I would like to to mention a forgotten char character and to make some shameless uh, self promotion. So there is uh, uh, Claude Shannon. Claude Shannon is uh, he created information theory uh, uh, and uh, the entropy. I mean, entropy was also by Fondelman and other people, but in an independent way. He developed entropy, uh, but what he also did for his master thesis was that uh, he connected all the logical functions in terms of and and of with uh, mechanical systems. So he was very close to these kind of ideas, and um, but he did other things after that. I mean, information theory was in 48, and at CAT there is this course, information theory from classical to quantum, uh, which uh, sometimes is given I mean, when overload is, is a lot. So this is the perceptron of Rosenblatt. So it's the same picture as I said before, it seems the same picture. The only difference is that 
um, the, in, the inputs may be, uh, non, I mean, any number. They need not, the inputs need not be uh, uh, zero, one, and uh, but this, otherwise it is the same. The same idea. And of course, Rosenblatt equals Maclopitz. This is just a stage. But Rosenblatt went one step further. He used this as a classifier, as I will explain later, to be able to classify two, uh, two classes which can be separated. I mean, that was not done by Maclopitz. They did a lot of things. Uh, if you can understand the paper, <laughs> but uh, they didn't do uh, a classification. This is not a point they had in mind. Uh, Rosenberg <laughs> was a psychologist. He wanted to do things which are related more to the brain and classifications and different kind of uh, problems. So in any event, so can can we, so uh, to go back to, uh, now we have a perceptron, or even with a maximal pits model, can we, uh, uh, realize or generate or simulate any Boolean function of any number of variables. So let's just see. Um, let's say you want, uh, maybe, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not in logic, so maybe I didn't take the official notation. For me, X and Y are two Boolean logic, and X union Y is uh, the, the union, I mean, like in, uh, maybe there is another term, but it would be phi of X plus Y minus one. Why? Because you want at least uh, X or Y to be one, then this would be at least zero, and so it would be one. But if the two are zero, five minus one is, is zero. The intersection is the same. I mean, I, and if you have a number of, uh, uh, any number of Boolean functions, it would be the same. I mean, for the union and the intersection. Now, um, can we realize any Boolean function in terms of a finite number of variables with one perceptron? One perceptron, I mean, uh, the answer is no. And this led to a lot of problems. But you see, um, I don't understand. Is x and y are zero? And then you, you get, you uh, get uh, minus uh, one. F or minus one. If x and y are zero, yeah. then x plus y minus one is minus one. Yeah. And phi of minus one is zero. Ah, okay. Yeah. And uh, let's, again, if x and y are one for the intersection, then two minus two is zero, and phi of zero is one. Because I took because I took the B-side function to have the one here. Okay, if I took okay. the one here, it would have to okay, change okay. a bit. But you see, now think about the following. Uh, suppose that I have the, at this point, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, and 1, 0. It corresponds to a certain, uh, uh, to a certain uh, uh, logical uh, Boolean function I would mention. But this you cannot uh, separate by, mm -hmm. uh, by, uh, by a straight line, this. So that was uh, perceptron controversy. You see, you look at um, the XOR function, or if you want the symmetric difference in, 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 in uh, sets. So, uh, Aditi has a, has a question. Could you read the question, please? Yes. Do the domains of the two outer of the heavyside function represent the two classes of the perceptron algorithm? Uh, no, no, if I, uh, if it, I'm not sure. I think I will give a better answer when I present the perceptron algorithm. Right now, it's a, uh, I cannot really answer the, the question as it is. The, the, the fee will allow you to change at each step the, uh, the hyperplane, but the, the model for the hyperplane. But here we don't see it yet. We are not yet at the upper plane. But a uh, uh, little patience when I get to the other way, you get to. So you see, the XOR is this, and uh, there is no way to separate by a, by a straight line. And this led to the so called perceptron controversy because people said it was useless because of that. And in fact, that, that's not true. Because even when you look, and they said that without even reading the book of Wasselblatt, when you read the book of Rosenblatt, he mentions that you can you cannot with one, but you can with a lot of uh, layers. You can you can set, you can um, uh, realize any Boolean function. But one thing was missing in the sixties, and why that, you know, what was missing was the feedback, what's so called the back back uh, propagation. back propagation. And without that, uh, it, it was still because of that, and not because of the perceptual controversy. But there was um, a lot of uh, bad blood there. In any event, you can express XOR with three or even two perceptrons. Here are the, the, the pictures. So you see, let us look at the first one with the three perceptrons. Each three is a perceptron, really. So let's say that X and Y are one. 
So I have phi of one, which is one, and I have phi of minus one, which is zero, and one minus two is uh, minus one, so the phi is zero. Suppose that x is one and y is zero, so you have uh, phi of zero, which is one, phi of uh, uh, once more one here, zero, which is one, and two minus two is zero, phi of zero is one. And the other one is a bit more involved, but uh, these are these are way. My next, uh, my two next slides are uh, the only drawing which I drew. There is first of all, it's a mystery, and the drawing are very not so nice, but I decided to keep them. But the idea is that with any really with any number of uh, you, uh, so sorry, what I wanted to say, it already hints at you kind of problems in mathematics because you see the functions you get are. Sum of composition of sum and, and in, in classical analysis, uh, classical problem, we don't see such functions. But here it's you have one given function, maybe, and, uh, and then you you iterate it, you add them together, but with one given function. And it, it, these are kind of uh, uh, problems which are, which are not from classical mathematics, I would say. Okay, so you as a, have a two picture here, it should be a plus one in the red here. It's a misprint I heard. It should be a plus one. And this is our picture. So the, the pictures are not nice, I apologize. But really, uh, these pictures, if I backtrack, are just to rewrite these in a picture way. Uh, but um, uh, OK. So the perceptron, I can be more than one hour, yes? How much do I still know? That's it. Uh, you would have to. Uh, the, the, to, to the, the physicist speaks 45 minutes, mm -hmm. the mathematician, one hour, and the philosopher, one hour. And hour. So if you want to go to be a philosopher, you can speak how, how, how much so we'll you see. want. But then you are a philosopher. So okay. give attention. Yes. So we'll see. No, you can speak. You can speak as much as you want with the risk that maybe you might be called a philosopher. <laughs> exactly. But so, you can speak by, uh, uh, how much you want. So the perceptron controversy was that uh, you cannot realize with one perceptron voxel, but uh, a single but a single perceptron is a linear classifier. So really, it's not surprising. And I said already in the part three of Rosenblatt's book, he calls multilayer perceptrons MLP. He already said that you need multilayer perceptrons. But what was missing was a back propagation algorithm, which was in the various, I don't know the whole history, but one person would be the Roman Hartington Williams uh, algorithm, but it was also before. And of course, maybe you have too many weights, so there is something which is called pruning. Uh, and uh, like uh, Hassibi, Strong, and Wolf has also how to prune, uh, how to, re to remove the connections in the neural, but to be already a neural networks, which are not so important. Okay, so um, there is, so we see that we have universal realization theorems, but a different kind of what we see in math, because, uh, and also you have a universal approximation theorem for continuous functions. But once more, the edge here is the inside function, and you can approximate the idea is that you will approximate any function by such uh, such, uh, such rectangle, and each of these is, is a difference of two uh, in side, really. But in, in practice, it's more difficult. And But I just mentioned that since a perceptron in principle is a linear classifier, then it will allow you to, to give a good approximation for, for to characterize shapes. Because each time you have a half, a half plane, and so you can look at shapes like this. Okay, so um, now we want a classification. So here I mentioned X-ray of COVID of pneumonia. And so you have, you'd like to make a classification. So you have two. Can you, can, you know, let's say you know that you can separate the two classes. How to do this? So this is really the picture we already saw. We already know ahead of time that we have two families which we can separate. It's not always the truth that we can separate that will lead us to uh, report synchronous spaces and, uh, and other topics. But if you know that you can separate, can you can you compute the can you hope to get uh, enough bounded number of steps? Can you hope to get the one hyperplane? The hyperplane will not be unique. If it is unique, it will not work here. It is very easy to define a situation where it will be unique. Just put points on the boundary here. But if it's unique, it will not work. So. Uh, I just recall you what is an hyperplane. It's a, it's an equation like this in Rn. Um, so the vector is called a feature vector. If you want after normalization, think of an apple. You characterize it by a number of characteristics. I mean, it's weight, acidity, whatever. You normalize everything, you have a vector. Okay. 
and uh, this is the, and so let's say you have two classes. The plus is above the, the, the hyper, hyperplane is a is a fancy word to say plane or line when you are in more than three dimensions, and so C minus would be when you're uh, below. And so can we compute? I said here the hyperplane is false. I want an hyperplane. The hyperplane certainly not. And uh, so. Your learning is doing a linear adjustment. We'll see that each time it makes some adjustment. And um, so here is a, a recall. So maybe it answers a bit. No, it will, in one moment it will answer a question you, you, you have. But here it's just recalling what is the, uh, if this is really the percept point, but now how do we do it? So let me, what is the setting? So we have a possibly infinite number of a family of vectors in the, the feature space Rn. Rn, when you are in machine learning, it's going to get promoted. It's called feature space. But I mean, it's our uh, usual Rn. And uh, here, n is finite. But uh, uh, then you divide it into classes. And you want to find, uh, you want to, and we know. I mean, we don't know the A. If we knew the A, there would be nothing to do. But we know there is an A, so that this holds. But we know more. We want to know that they will be strictly separated, meaning that this infimum is bigger than delta. We don't know the delta, of course. And the bond will be on the, the bond we have will be depend on the delta. But we suppose that they are strictly separated. So if it is a finite number of uh, a finite number of uh, elements, this will always be true. I think we take b equals zero. We want uh, uh, an hyperplane which passes through the origin. But if it is infinite, it means really that uh, they are far away. They do not they do not uh, touch the, play, the hyperplane. Which we don't know. And another hypothesis, uh, the hyperplane will not be unique, but this is our hypothesis. But we don't know the A and we don't know the delta, we just know they exist. And from this existence, one can find an algorithm which will separate in a finite number of steps. It's very powerful because they could be infinite for all what we know the classes. So it's a bit strange, but, but it is true. So, what is for, for my yeah. hyperplane here, it doesn't mean uh, sub. Vector space, right? Because zero doesn't have to be there. Is is the a vector plane is a is a line or a plane, a plane, a plane. yeah, but they don't have to cross zero, right? They don't have to go through zero. If, no, if, no, no, it's the linear... no, no, no. Here it goes through zero, but in general, no. Okay. No, no. If you allow me to backtrack here, you see the hyperplane you put a B. Oh, right, there's a B. Yeah, but 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 um, fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. But here I, I just want it. I mean, the way it is done, it goes through zero. Okay. But you can make a, a, yeah. a shift. Okay, so I just repeat myself here, but we, we want a bounded, bounded number of steps. And what is the algorithm? Um, it's, it seems, it seems uh, well, one has to think about it, but it is uh, it is uh, iteration. So you start with, uh, let's say, A0. If it works, fine. Otherwise, you add to HMU. If you're in the wrong side, you add. If you're on the... On the or you add, or you, uh, or you add, or you remove, depending if you had, uh, if if if, if uh, your um, classification was wrong, and this gives you a sequence a zero, a one, a two, and the idea is that after a bounded number of steps, it's it's stationary. Of course, you will never know when it is stationary, so there is a bit of lie here, <laughs> but. Because how do I know? I know, but, but uh, you prove that it will be stationary. But when you do it in practice, you will not know. But still, since you know it will be stationary, when you when you do it in practice, you you can. Um, I mean, this is a, this is the theoretical uh, justification, if you want. You know it will be stationary, mm -hmm. but uh, there is no. I mean, you ask me how do I know? Well, I cannot. But here is the bond. The bond is is one over delta square. And so delta is delta was the. The, the hypothesis was that we have a, a A which we don't that. know with this delta. So these are important details for the theory, but in practice, it's more important to know that we can separate in a fine, in a bounded. This is what it means. So uh, it has a long history. The, the proof that I, I will give, I'm not sure I will give a proof, but our outline is on Nilsson. It's on the book of Minsky and Papert on the perceptron. Uh, now it's interesting that they are precursors. So um, the, already in '45, Admon, before he was a big shot in PDs, he wrote a paper uh, on uh, not on this, of course, but on uh, 
kind of linear programming in some sense. And both Skin and Schoenberg, our Schoenberg for the analyst, also worked on worked on this. And um, uh, but of course on linear programming, things which are nothing to do with rhetoric, but how to separate linear programming. So uh, I forgot what is linear programming when I was in engineering school. I studied it, but uh, I mean I know what it is, but I would not be able to to use it. Anyway, um, the Botskin was an interesting character, and uh, his thesis was really uh, uh, the beginning of uh, linear programming somehow. But uh, it was in German, and it had to be translated before um, before it was recognized as important. Okay, so I will not uh, I will not do the details here, but there are four steps. I would like just to mention a bit the steps of the perceptron algorithm. So first, you suppose there is only one class. It seems paradoxical, but it's very easy. You put a minus to one of a class, and then they're all in one side. So you suppose that there's only one class, and then uh, you normalize, and then you see you see that every time there is a change, the norm of a square of a, of your uh, the a is the direct the, the gradient. I mean the, orth the orthogonal direction of your plane. The square is m plus one. Up to here, you don't need the hypothesis. And then here, uh, you suppose that if you have m changes, then you have m plus 1 delta is less than this, and you get a contradiction because uh, here you would have a m square on the left and the m on the right. So, and the proof, I will not go over it, I think, but it is each time you see, uh, it, uh, the first one is really. Um, by the assumption when you have a wrong direction, something is negative and you put zero instead. But I will not go into the detail. The other one use Cauchy Schwartz. So I like also to tell my students that Cauchy Schwartz is very important. But you see, uh, still the first line here, the second line of each time you add one number, one vector. So it goes a bit before, a bit upper, a bit lower, a bit up, at, at one stage it will be it, it will not uh, you don't add at one stage. You don't need to add. And uh, but, that, that's all. But I will not go. I will not go into the details. I mean, that's. Uh, but uh, so, so that, and, and this proof works for classes. The classes A and B, or, or so, are not not being finite. Yes, yes. No, not for discrete. They have to be right. Don't, they don't even have to be discrete. I think. Okay. Uh, for this, I did triple check, but I think, but finite is probably not. Mm -hmm. And I think they don't have to be discrete. Uh, I don't, as far as I recall. But you get a contradiction like this. Is if you abandon M. So you know that it will be stationary after a certain number of steps, but you don't, of course, uh, in practice, you don't know when this step is. Yes, uh, anyway, so it's, uh, if you want the perceptron is one directional, uh, this is very important, no feedback. I mean, there is no feedback. The feedback uh, would be with the uh, back propagation algorithm. And if you want, it is the smallest artificial neural network which can learn a linear problem. I mean, this is a good <laughs> to explain what, uh, what, uh, what uh, was in the previous slides, and uh, when you need uh, for other uh, more complicated uh, uh, Boolean functions, I don't know why I wrote here nonlinear. Forget about the nonlinear. I mean, for more general uh, Boolean functions, then you need the more uh, well. What do I want to say here? I've, well, it's not related really to the algorithm as sentence, so maybe we can forget about it. Okay, so now. Um, the mathematical part of the lecture. Suppose we cannot, suppose we, we are here, we cannot separate them. So okay. you could think that maybe we can lift and we can lift a bit or think we are on a, a like a differential uh, on, a, on a surface, we can kind of uh, pull out the surface and separate them. So the idea is that, um, uh, so we, this is the input space and you cannot separate them. But maybe you can hope. And in fact, for finite things, it will always be possible when you go uh, uh, in a space which is uh, large enough. You can imagine that you can't, if you can't trans, if you can map your original data by a one-to-one uh, one uh, function in a much higher space, you can hope maybe that you can separate. But what is the problem? Is that what do you gain here? You don't gain anything. If you're in R3 and you go to R1 million, uh, what does it help you? Not very much. So there is a trick to, to do it. There is a way. I mean, in, and um, so it's called. So it's called the kernel, kernel trick. I will explain in one moment. But so uh, to go back to my picture here. So 
if you embed, we, we could hope that we embed our M into our P, where P is much larger, with, with a map, a map T, which would be one to one, and that in this other space we can separate. But what is the problem? T is, T is, T is not good. So the hope was maybe we can use not T, but this function, the inner product of Tx and Ty. And such functions are very important in mathematics. They are called positive definite functions or positive kernels. And so we have here a, a link between uh, well, machine learning and, and this very, very difficult, interesting topic. So we, now I put here a warning, functional analysis alert. Now here we need the metric spaces. I will not give all the details. Positive definite matrices, positive definite functions, and reporting kernel in both spaces. But the idea is that the idea is the following. You have your you have here your points. You are in R N. Then I have a T of X, which was written as P as uh, uh, as P of X, but P of X you are in a much larger R P. But this is too big. I don't want to it doesn't help. But I want instead of this, I want to use this function, which is scalar. Of course, there are no free lunches, and this is a scalar functions of two variables, but still it helps to make things in a much easier way. So we will not see the T. The idea is that when we do this, we don't see the T. We will work directly with positive definite functions. These are called positive definite functions when they are such an inner product. We don't see the T. So you don't see that you have a very high dimension because this here is a scalar dimension. So you go to a much higher dimension via a scalar function. But the scalar function is of two variables, of course. And so this is the the idea, but, but what is behind? So be, behind is the following thing, which is, I mean, it's a well-known fact, but it's not always explained in books, but it's well-known. I mean, the following. And this is, if you want to, the, if you want to know what is, uh, 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 I mean, the approach of positive deficit kernels, this is really what picture I'm going to, going to do here. Here you have, your, your distance is x minus y, but you don't care. Here is, T of X minus T of Y. But when you compute the distance T of X minus T of Y square, you get K, and I write K of X Y is the inner product of T of X, T of Y, you get K of X X plus K of Y Y, and if it is real minus two K of X Y, if it is complex, you need a real. So, uh, it's, it just means this is a metric. I mean, if it's one to one. So it just says that you have changed. You, rather than say you go to a higher dimension, you can say, I'm saying on the same set, but I change the metric. And in this new metric, I can separate. And, but you see, when I'm here, I don't, I don't see the T, I don't care about it. Here is just in terms of a kernel. Of course, one link is missing. I will explain in one moment. The link which is missing is what, is, how do, what are these functions? which we want. And these functions are exactly the functions which we can factorize. Maybe it will be infinite dimensional, but k of x, y, we will call it positive definite if and only if we can factorize. I should give some definitions, but I, I, I don't want to, to give too to, to many definitions, but this is the, but the, the key. If you want, leave a key, and in most machine learning books, it's not written, although it's a fact which is on for a very long time, is that this is when you take a square root, if you want less here, this is a new metric on your space. So you say on the same space, but you have a new metric on it, that's all. And so with a new metric, you can know that you can separate. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. So this is the, difference of, the definition of a metric space, uh, a metric. Uh, just for fun, I just want, want, wanted to mention this fact. It's not related, it's kind of an internet. So yes. So you see, let's say you want to, so it's not related to what I said before and to what I will say after, but I think it's an interesting fact. Uh, so you, I look at sets. So A, B, five, I've said. You see what's written upstairs, D of A, B, uh, the cardinal of a uh, symmetric difference if, 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 divided by the cardinal of a union, it's a distance. It's not so easy to prove, but it is a distance. But sometimes you don't want the distance. You want to see when things are similar. And then you look here at one minus D, the cardinal of the intersection divided by the cardinal of a union. Then it's a measure of similarity. And this was found already in 1901 by a Swiss botanist Jacquard. 
où ils ont dit que les coefficients de communauté, ils ont dit qu'on perd flora dans différentes différentes parts en Switzerland. Et vous pensez que votre différent You think about the supermarket and you have two shopping carts. So you want to compare, you, you would compare what is together and the union. You will not compare with the whole thing. And this is uh, um, what's called, uh, well, it's a, it's a similarity. It's so, uh, they call it similarity metric, but it's not a metric. But, uh, but it was just, just a small interruption. I think it was, inter it, what is interesting is that Jacquard did this in 1901. I mean, before we were metric spaces and everything, he did this for, for his own purposes, and then it was re rediscovered. So, uh, in any event, so in one line, we just change the metric, it's what I already said uh, a couple of times. And you see an example here. Uh, so, this is a positive metric. You, you have the original feature, and you add, when you put uh, powers also, you add, uh, you add dimensions. But one thing is missing here. So, and downstairs, I see how I can factorize. One thing is missing is what is the connection between positive definite, between how can we characterize these functions? Is there a way to characterize these functions independent of a T? So there would be two different facts. First, I characterize them in a way independent of a T, but I know there is a T. So I know it corresponds to what we want to do. And these are called, um, These are called positive definite functions. Uh, the definition is here. Uh, I will talk quickly about this. I mean, for those of you who are interested, I have my slides and I can give more details. I don't think uh, it's, it, it is a very important notion, but I will not uh, give too, too much details. The important fact is that there is a whole theory of positive definite functions, and we can use this whole theory to, I mean, I don't do this, but we can, one can use to, uh, to, to, do, uh, to do this separation with a, uh, What the machine learning they call the kernel trick. But it's just, so this is, um, and there is, so forget about this one. The, the, the key here is a factorization property that the function is positive definite. And this we know to work if and only if it is factorizable. So here you have a map. This is also the map, but, uh, the map, but this is a map in some sense which is connected to, um, uh, to, to the machine learning. What is important is that some products of positive definite functions are still positive definite. And so you can play a lot and find new, new ways to, to connect. There are a lot of it, very interesting mathematics uh, behind this. Uh, what I'm going to say here is a bit different. The last slides are a bit different. I just, so if you want up to the previous slide, it, it is related to the perceptron already. We explain the perceptron and when, when it's too, When we cannot separate, we go to a, to a higher dimension. So this is, in some sense, uh, almost the end of the talk. What I wanted to mention here is something a bit different, but quite often, in fact, in machine learning, these are interpolation problems, I already mentioned, but a, a, a different type. Because you don't, you don't use uh, Hermit polynomials or whatever, these are functions of a completely different type, which you get by iteration and so on. So this is, these are different kind of problems, which When a mathematician looks at this, it seems very strange. Um, so it can be function of this type and, and the uh, composition of their law. So it's very, uh, very strange. You get strange problems. Uh, some mathematicians have tried to work on this. Um, I, don't know there, I don't think there are very much results, but some mathematicians have tried to, I, I know a couple of papers, but it's not so easy. Uh, we're speaking about, uh, about uh, If it's like functions, so one can do some other functions. You see, the inside function is not, uh, is not continuous. Now, this function here, the sigmoid function, not only it has a different, it is differentiable, but you have here this relation. So we, when you look for formulas, and you, you have a connection between the derivative and the function, it makes formulas much easier, in particular for the backpropagation algorithm. And here is another one with a hyperbolic tangent and another connection. The importance here is that it looks like the V-side function, but there is an underlying ODE, I mean, phi prime here, which in fact uh, allows you to get nice formula in some sense. And the, here I will really uh, finish, but we saw, so if you want, um, there is a whole part of, uh, which I've not discussed, and the, the point of the lecture was the perceptron, but there is a whole part which is very interesting about the, uh, Collective emergent properties when you have large problems. And it's, it's uh, and this really brings us to upfield mode, to upfield networks really. 
Uh, well, uh, I will not discuss that, but it would be another, another talk, but he, he uses the metropolis algorithm I, I mentioned at the beginning. He, he, he has a notion of, of energy and memories. It's uh, 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 um, content addressable memories, not random as a uh, really like minimum, minimum energy thing. So this is a thing which are completely, completely different. So, um, this is a, so this is a report, uh, field model. I mean, op optimally there would be um, Maculopit, um, Rosenblatt, and Opfield. But I mean, Opfield would take, would take us too long. But he introduced, well, it's very difficult to say introduced, I guess it was also before, but the notion of energy. And so he wanted to minimize the energy. And, um, and uh, minimum energy corresponding to stable. Um, Stable states which have lack of memories for them. So that's the idea. And it's, it's uh, explained also in the, in the book of Daniel Amit. So I would like to conclude here. So uh, I just want to mention that there are a lot, a number of differences, very important differences between artificial neural networks and classical computers, which we can see from what I discussed a bit before the localization, that there will be content addressable memories rather than random access memories and emergent properties. But I didn't discuss this, but still, but, and I would like to say that uh, uh, machine learning uses a lot, a lot of uh, mathematical tools. This is why I like to teach. What I teach at CAS is the mathematics behind it, not the, not the algorithm. And uh, I mentioned here something like graph theory, dynamical system, uh, metric spaces. Uh, you see here uh, a paper, a book using uh, uh, algebraic geometry. Even. And um, I would like to say that you pick your favorite math field. That would, it has been used or will be used, really. So this is what I wanted to say. The last part I was a bit quick, but I mean it would be to go to the. Uh, of, I would I would encourage you to go to the uh, papers of Upfield and see, and these are really the main ideas behind Upfield. So that's I will I will stop here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So we have plenty of time to ask questions. So is a mathematician or a philosopher? Uh, it's it's a mathematician, but with a tendency of uh, okay. <laughs> philosophical tendency, dangerous <laughs> philosophical tendency. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm curious. I understand what random access memories are in classical uh, calculus computers, but content addressable memories in neural networks, how are they defined? How does it work? Well, these are the models, I, I don't say very exist yet, I mean, these are the models telling you that, um, uh, yeah, I mean, these are the, they're more robust, I mean, they have the minimal energy. Think about the following, uh, you have a dynamical system, and you have a number of uh, basis of attraction, okay? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and this is like with the models with, uh, of fit. So you have a, uh, you have your dynamical system and you can separate it in the number of, of base. And so each time you are, let's say what you, this is here the minimal energy. And when you're here, we, we, you, 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 you say you belong to this space in some sense. Okay. But you ask me if it's in practice in a computer, I don't know. I don't think so yet. But in, uh, in the models uh, of, of uh, networks with uh, fit models and other models, this is what is happening. That you, let's put it that way. In, in communication theory, you have a number of, in, in error coding, error coding space, you, you have what? You have, let's say you have code words, which are GF2 to the power N, mm -hmm. and then you have your code words, and then around it, you have a number of, you allow a number of mistakes, and you have this. Yes. So this is error correcting code. Here, it's a bit different. And I don't say it's in practice yet, but simply uh, in the papers at least I read with my students, it, it, it said, so you have a dynamical <coughs> system, you have so many more stable states, you have basin of attractions, and so all these questions to one memory in some sense. I see. So this is a full picture of a person you, uh, you, you, you know, and then part of the picture would be like this here, in some sense. Mm -hmm. But once more, this is more a model, I don't claim it exists uh, as of now. I mean, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> But the introduction, yes? Do we have some kind of Kirchhoff law as in electric uh, network? Uh, I'm sure that yes. I think I saw something like this, but I cannot answer. But I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, uh, I know what you, 
when we look at uh, uh, yes when you look at artificial neural networks which are uh, GNN which are graph you uh, then you you have but I don't know I, I don't know what I forgot to say that but there there is a Laplacian on the graph and so on and all yeah, the theory yeah, yeah. which is yeah. the graph theory is used so is it very scared of a dichotomy because people who use who use uh, machine learning I mean I don't want, I mean a lot of people they don't really know or care what is be, uh, what is under the hood in some sense but suddenly when you try to see and it is in books I mean read books on which are called machine learning you have all these details and all the details in graph theory with the Laplacian and all the other things which are used to develop the, the algorithm or to some I guess but uh, I see so you you, you do have yes Yes. yes. Well, there was a question on the. Uh, ah, there someone. was a question. Ah, yes. Yeah, there was a question. Yes. Does the kernel trick really offer a savings over mapping to a higher dimensional feature space? Is, is the difference like knowing the induced metric on a surface? requires less information versus <laughs> the full embedding of the surface in space. I think the whole point of the kernel trick, yes, that you, I mean, I, I, I don't, I, mean, I don't work on this in practice, but I think what people say, you, you, you save a lot because you look at a function of one variable, I mean, no, of two variables, a scalar function, a scalar function, and your T of X is embedded in the positivity, but you, you don't have it, you don't look at it. So you, uh, there may be other ways based on what uh, on the question, but in practice, you know that you see it's like if you want a T of X, but you don't want, but you have a positive function which are positive definite. This and this are the same, but I work on this. I don't care about the T of X, and this is scalar. So this is uh, and some are very important, like also like. Uh, uh, in the theory of uh, radial basis function and so on, like the paper with Kamal, but this is another topic. I was going to ask about that. The um, hyper complex numbers, and the theory of hyper complex numbers, can they? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. yes. Lot of, I, I, I forgot to mention this. Um, uh, well, uh, we, we have uh, some papers with very complex, but I mean, uh, with, Mikhail, with Mikhail and, and, and Kamal, we have a paper on the perceptron algorithm in the complex setting and, and my complex setting. Uh, people, some, uh, there, was some, there was something in the complex setting which was completely wrong. Uh, but uh, yes, it, it allows you to save, to save uh, I assume, but it allows you to save computation because you gather in one number mm -hmm. more, like when you go from real to complex, mm -hmm. then you can go to bit more. And there have been work, yes, for the hyperbolic numbers, for the quaternion even. Uh, now, is it so serious? I don't know, because I see all these papers, a lot of mathematics, and then some pictures at the end with some graph. Uh, I, I cannot judge if uh, this is true or this is just a graph which is written just to justify the, the paper. But there is work on this, absolutely. And, 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 and books of it, even. But I'm sure there is work to be done. There is a lot of work to be done. Yes. So uh, I, I, I didn't understand you very well on the whole, but uh, uh, I understood that in your presentation of the uh, you underline that it is about finding a hyper, a hyper plane yeah. which is going to separate the yes. data. And, uh, in my experience in uh, neural networks, uh, the goal was always uh, modeling through attractors. And uh, you mean more in, uh, some, like, like in, some on, in some of your slides, I saw hope, hope field yes, yes, yes. and spin glasses, yes. which, which is an approach by attractors. Oh, yeah, this is what I was explaining to you. Is it something that you taught us that uh, at the beginning, perception was about separating the data yes. with a hyperplane, and then people went to attractor models. Yes, yes, like Opfield or Daniel Amit or other people. But I didn't speak very much about it during this lecture, just after the, after the question of... Uh... Another uh, indicative question. Uh, I saw in one of your slides the name of Kohonen. 
Yes, yes. And I remember that Grossberg and Kohonen were neuroscientists who, who were describing uh, biology of the brain in terms of dynamical systems. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes. In the 50s, I think. Yeah, these are all books. He has, a, he has a, what's, Kohonen has also the associative memories, absolutely, yes, yes. I didn't speak, of, I just mentioned, he didn't speak about associative memories, but absolutely, yes, absolutely. And had you spoken uh, of attractor models, you would have mentioned René Tom, I guess. Yes, yes, yes. I just <laughs> briefly mentioned about the, uh, I mentioned the uh, catastrophe. Yeah, that's, that's one line. Yes, it's not cool. I know, but one line. <laughs> yes, but uh, the, the purpose of the talk was much more modest to speak about the neuron, the perceptron, and uh, how it goes. That was the idea. Do you have any other questions? Well, it, it possibly a very stupid question. But, uh, you said that the perceptron separates, yes. uh, 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 let's say, a set of objects into a class by a neighbor plan. But uh, how to separate? You know how, how, in your in your uh, in your um, graph, mm -hmm. the, the, the the objects are already separated yeah, because you know there are the green see. and the red. Yeah. You so know you how can I choose what is those that have one 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 side and the other? So we work. Who work? They the work of fixing which one of the objects are A and which yeah, one and of the are B. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I mean that's. Um... I understand the question. We we know and don't know. If we knew, there would be nothing to do. But we know that they can be separated, and then there is algorithm which, if you want to have a two classes here, like, yes. like this, we don't uh, we don't know. Then there will be nothing to do. But then by the algorithm, so you if you want, you start. Maybe you start like this, and then you are like and, and you move. Okay, that's the yeah. So, in fact, what it is that algorithm does is simply to find the good hyperplane. Yes, yes, yes. But one, not one hyperplane. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, one, one between yeah, the good yeah, algorithm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. But now suppose that you are not cross and circle. You are only cross. And you don't know exactly which cross are the good one and which oh, are the yeah, bad ones. Uh... You have the good student and the bad student, but you don't know which are the ones, the good and the ones. Yeah. So, Okay. Uh, that's, well, that's, is uh, an algorithm to, to separate when you already have the separation, or you can give also you a tool. If I do, I say another way, if I go intelligent, intelligent artificial intelligence, and I want to make or apply a, an algorithm, uh, what I want to know is to separate the, the patient that have cancer with the patient mm -hmm. that has not cancer. Yeah. But I don't know how to separate that. Oh, but if, yeah, if you now it's more on the level of a neural networks. This was the, the building block at the beginning. Mm -hmm. No, after oh, okay. That... So yeah, the point is, is simply the the, the geometry. Yeah, yeah, of yeah. The but then, then it's done okay. with a number of layers. No, no. Yeah. Okay. And I wanted more to describe something which is kind of history, kind of link between two topics. Okay. Yeah. But as I said, after that you have a number of layers and it's much. And the number of layers. So number of layers means I make. A, Arbitrary separation, yeah. and then I evaluate the separation. I correct, I correct. Oh, you can correct. do much more things, okay. not only okay. really okay. separate. Okay, okay. now, now I see it. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. yes. So for example, imagine that you have uh, 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 pictures of pears and pictures of uh, apples, and then you want to have an algorithm that separates both. Then uh, what you do first is you choose some of those pictures of pears. You know those are pears, and some of those pictures that are apples, those are apples. Then you you do this algorithm. And then you look, person is not good because you say some pair and some pair. Yeah, here. exactly. Then, some, then you, and then you refine your separation. Then you refine exactly. the separation. And, and, okay, then, okay. and then the others, you, you, you can you train your, your system. Okay, right? okay, 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 okay. That's clear. That's clear. Yes. Okay. Can, I'm say, can, we, can we go to the slide where we have curve separating? Yeah. This one? Yes. So now uh, this curve can be sent conformally to line. 
can find conformal map, yeah. sending the curve but, but the light. It's also more complicated than not connected. They need uh, blocks here and there. I don't know. But we still keep the separation. But we will have, we will have maybe here you have small blue disk and small blue red. Yeah. But after the conformal map, we will have red and yes. blue, but not yes. I'm not sure I understand the question. We just make a conformal map to send the curve into a line. No, because what is misleading here is that you see the solution. When you work, you don't know the solution. You know there is a solution you don't see. Mm -hmm. But of course, I understand what you mean. If you know the solution, if you know, I agree with you absolutely, yes. But what is the reason, I support that reason of mathematical simplicity, but I don't understand for which Sorry, there is another question, but then I finish my yes. uh, uh, For the people, for the person in, uh, in the wood, in the, in the room, I saw the question, I'd like mm -hmm. to finish. Uh, what, what is the, 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 the reason for which I want an hyperplane rather than another course? Simply because Simply it's a first degree equation, yes, it's yes, simple yes. to manipulate. Yes, I think so. Yes, yes. That, and there is and no, nothing. You can I think that you can approximate, <laughs> I mean, uh, shape by hyperplane. Yes. yes. But, uh, so if I separate by a, a, a conics, for example, uh, I'm sure it's a little bit more complicated. Yeah, I mean, uh, I would say yes. I mean, okay. In, in principle, the same the question of mathematical simplicity. I think so, yes. Okay. Now, an interesting, let me see, no. Yeah, yeah, uh, yes, but uh, does the kernel trick, this is, we say, okay, like to determine a metric on a surface require one bilinear form that in, induce a Riemann metric while embedding the surface in space requires two forms, metric plus second fundamental form, and we don't care about the specific embedding chosen. Okay, this is another question. But these are not the tools which are used. I, I, indeed, I spoke of a surface and I wanted to explain. So I'm, I, I'm guilty of but, that. Uh, but this uh, is not what we are using. Really, I was saying maybe it's of the plane and we go to a higher dimension using the, this uh, function K. But that's all. This is there almost is a, all. another comment. But Jess, that Jess is the person to make this comment. You can speak to if you want, uh, instead of writing. Mm -hmm. You can speak. Oh, I did. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, a, it's something that I tell my students about oh, you know, when you, oh, you start no, doing. Oh, no, 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 sorry. When when you start uh, looking at images like the the space of images that contain a dog, uh, if you add together two of those images, it will most likely still contain a dog. Uh, you know, <laughs> so that tells you something very very special about these data sets that have features. You know, they're very low dimensional or very very close to being affine. Yeah, I, I like uh, yeah I'm sorry. Can, can you repeat your, your comments? Yeah, because I agree that the comment that he, he, he made, an interesting yeah. comment about images, the set of images that do something like contain a dog is evidently very close to being a linear subspace. You can tell by taking two great scale images of dogs. If you add those together, I bet most humans would still say the resulting image contain a dog. Yeah, I mean, I don't... Uh, it's not clear to me the point. Jess, perhaps, can you clarify this comment? Oh, it was just a comment about this, you know, this, these, of course, these data sets, they're, they're actually like very, you know, they might seem very complicated, but, you know, the whole point of the subject is to find these very, they're actually quite simple, you know, even though they're high dimensional, they're like, the set of images that contains, for example, a dog is is actually a much lower dimensional set than a much simpler set than the set of all images. You know. I'm not sure. I can't. So he says. Uh, let me repeat. Uh, he says the, for example, think about the set of all images, mm -hmm. and uh, think about the set of all the images that contain a dog. Mm -hmm. So this is a much, much, much smaller set in comparison with yeah. all the others. So the dimensions that you need in order to describe this this subset is, is really low, sure. right? So th those methods are, are not really okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's just a comment. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Other questions? Any other questions? Huh? So if there's other questions, we can separate ourselves, but the question is whether we separate by the hyperplane yeah. or in which dimension. 
we can separate ourselves. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, and, and thank you also to the people in. Uh, yes, in, thank uh, you. And before we go, let me let me. Next uh, next seminar. Yeah, next it, seminar will be this Wednesday. This coming coming Wednesday. It's coming Wednesday. Uh, it is going to be in collaboration with the IQS seminar, so the uh, quantum science, uh, quantum studies, and it is uh, this Wednesday at 